We're in a series called Grace, and we've been looking at this unique gift that keeps on giving. And have you ever been the recipient of a gift that keeps on giving? You may think of a puppy, Tupperware. Maybe you have a membership to Costco, the zoo, a gym. A few Christmases ago, our family was given a subscription to the Jelly of the Month Club. It kept on giving. Next month is marmalade. But we're going to talk about something far more thrilling than that, and that is God's gift of grace. Grace is God's undeserved favor. It's the kindness of God to people who don't deserve it, could never earn it. It's God's kindness to people like you and me. This past week as I was getting ready, just this thought kept running through my mind. How amazing is it that this is even a thing that exists, that we can talk about God's grace, that there's a good God that gives to us. It is the best news ever. It is 100% true grace. And the great thing about grace is there's a lot more where that came from. Grace is unprecedented. It's unrivaled in its power and its impact, which begs our question for this morning, can grace possibly be limited in the life of a believer? Grace is revolutionary, but can it be restricted or held back in our lives? Are there decisions that we make or actions that we would choose that would hold back or limit the grace of God in our lives we so desperately need? To get the answer to that question, we're going to dive into a parable that Jesus tells. It's found in Matthew 18, and we'll start with verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore... The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, all that he had, be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, why does Jesus tell us this parable? It's in response to a question that Peter asks in verse 21. He says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? We don't know what prompted Peter to ask this. Maybe there was some drama brewing amongst the disciples. Maybe Andrew is getting on Peter's nerves again. And so Peter comes up and he proposes seven times as the number he could forgive that day. And no doubt Peter felt like he was going above and beyond the call of duty by suggesting seven. The rabbis used to teach that you could forgive a man a second time or a third time, but the fourth time you don't forgive him, and the reason is Amos. Not famous Amos, the cookie guy. Amos, the prophet. Amos 1.3. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, 
even for four. I will not relent. And so the rabbis taught this meant God could forgive Damascus three times, but on the fourth time, he couldn't forgive them anymore and judgment would fall. So they said, look, if God only has to forgive three times, then surely we only have to forgive three as well. Peter, knowing that Jesus, he never lowers the standard, he always raises the standard, knowing that Jesus always called them to a higher level of love, Peter does an enviable thing. He takes the rabbi's quota of three and he more than doubles it. So Peter proposes, seven times, Lord, what do you think of that? Now, I don't know if you picked up on it, but there's a fundamental error in Peter's whole question. The error is this. Peter's question implies that there is a limit to forgiveness. Do you pick that up? Peter's question implies that there's some point, maybe it's seven, maybe it's 18. Whatever it is, we reach a point where we can say with justification, I forgive you no more. And so in response to Peter, Jesus says this in verse 22, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Other translations say 70 times seven, which is 490. Jesus is not teaching us to keep score or to say that when you get to 78 or to 491 that you can stop. That's not the point. The point is to say, Peter, forgiveness is unlimited. I don't want you counting. I don't want you to reach the point where you say, I've had enough of you. Peter, I don't want you counting at all. I want forgiveness and grace to be unlimited. And so he tells this parable. This is the context of his teaching that we as disciples have the obligation to forgive. And that we don't just have the obligation to forgive, but we have the obligation to forgive eternally and unlimited. And now I should say before we go any further that this teaching, this parable, is for believers only. You see, if you have not experienced the forgiveness of our master yet, though this parable may seem inspirational to you, you cannot know the impact unless you know what it's like to have your sin, your debt, completely wiped away. We're going to believe you're going to do that by the end of our time together, if you haven't already. So if you're not a Christian, your greatest need is not that you would learn how to forgive. Your greatest need, you need to get right with God. You need to accept the forgiveness of the master. But for believers here, forgiveness is where the rubber meets the road. It is the defining issue whether you'll flourish in the grace of God or you'll limit God's grace. So Jesus shares here in verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And Jesus really here is describing a great earthly monarch. And these are not lowly servants. You know, this is not a butler or a gardener or a baker. These are like provincial governors he had under him. And he's calling them to an account of how they're running their governorships. Verse 24, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Would you agree that if you owe someone 10,000 bags of gold, you're a little in over your head? How many would say that? You know, it reminds me, speaking of bags, back in high school, our youth group here at church, we went on a choir tour. On our way back, we stopped at the Mall of America. And my friend and I, we went into a candy store, you know, one where you kind of mix all the different candies into one bag and it weighs by the pound. And so he grabs four pretty large bags and he just starts filling them up to the brim. So it's filled with all sorts of chocolates and gummy bears and gumballs and suckers. It's all mixed in together. I'm like, you know, that's going to be kind of expensive. He's like, don't worry, I've got a $20 bill here. It was the mid-90s, so he goes up to the cashier and like, that will be $80. My friend's like, all I've got is a 20. (sighs) Okay, you take that bag, we'll take back these three, resort them. 
And that all kind of worked out. But how many know there's a big difference between four bags of candy and 10,000 bags of gold? Other translations say that the debt was 10,000 talents, and a talent was the largest denomination of money at the time. We can find out in history that the total tax revenue of all five provinces, which are now Israel and Jordan, but under Herod the Great, the total tax revenue for the entire year was 900 talents. So this is a huge debt. One talent equals 6,000 denarii, and a denarius was the typical day's wage. And so doing the math, this servant owes his creditor 60 million denarii, or 60 million days of work. That would take him 194,383 years to pay off if he earned a denarius each day, didn't take a day off, and if 100% of his earnings went towards the debt, oh, and by the way, if there's no interest. And you thought it's taking forever to pay off your car loan. Have you ever racked up a debt and it becomes so great you don't see any way from out under it? You know, during college, I worked in the billing department of a cell phone company, and it was a great time of life. During the day, I got to worship, pray, learn about Jesus, the Bible. At night, I got to shut off people's phones who didn't pay their bill. It was really a wonderful season of balance in my life. <laughs> and I remember one customer called up one night with a $14,000 phone bill for one month for one phone. They had no idea how they could rack up such a bill. And so I said, well, let's uh, pull up the invoice. Let's start looking through the call log here. And I said, do you remember, uh, there's a call on here for 400 minutes to another country on another continent. I said, do you remember making a 400 minute phone call? I'm like, well, I think so. I said, well, that entire call was roaming and it was billed at $4 a minute. And so the only thing that I was authorized to do on behalf of the company was to split the bill into two payments. So I said, don't worry about this. I can take a payment for 7,000 now over the phone. <laughs> we'll keep the line active. And then you call me next week. We'll take the other 7,000. We'll be all squared away. Click. So Jesus tells the story of a man, he's racked up a debt. The sum is so vast, it drives home the point. There's no way to pay this. It's impossible. Verse 25, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Notice that. He's just asking for patience. He's just asking for more time. Would you please give me 194,000 more years to pay off the bill? He doesn't ask the king to cancel the debt. He just says, give me more time. Be patient. And then next really comes the heart of the king, the most moving part of this parable, verse 27. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. You see, the master was moved with compassion, and that's so beautiful, and that is so descriptive, exactly how God looks at every one of you today. That's grace. He's moved with pity. He's moved with compassion. It's the same word used when Jesus would look on the multitudes, that he was moved with compassion and grace, and the master says, let him go, and he forgave the whole debt. Isn't that incredible? You know, I'm not just going to be patient with you. I'm not going to just give you two payments. I'm not going to extend the terms. I'm going to wipe out the entire debt so you owe me nothing. And if that's not a picture of grace, I don't know what is. You know, grace is beautiful. Grace will change your life. 
It is shocking in its impact and scope. And if the story ended right there, it's a powerful story. But there's one more twist, verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And that's equal to a hundred denarii. And Jesus chooses two contrasting amounts to make the point the difference between what the servant owed his master and what his fellow servant owed him are worlds apart. One is completely inconsequential by comparison. And the forgiven servant, we're told, grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Does that sound familiar? That is word for word. That is exactly what he had just pleaded moments ago to his master. The same words, would you be patient with me? Allow me to repay. But this time, the plea is not met by grace. This time, the, there's a hardened heart. Verse 30, but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And this was a very common thing with debtors at the time. Sometimes they had money stashed away. And then when you finally threw them in prison, they would have a relapse of memory. Oh yeah, I have cash over there. Sometimes it would be rich relatives or friends. They would come pay off the debt and bail them out. So he throws them in jail for 100 days wages when he had been forgiven 194,000 years. What a shocking lack of grace. I mean, this servant who has been forgiven so much, now unwilling to show even the smallest amount of forgiveness. Verse 31, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. And that's a fact. And so he starts with a fact, but now he's going to make an indictment in verse 33. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Shouldn't you have shown grace? Couldn't you have an ounce of mercy just as I had on you? And after giving him an effect and an indictment, now he gives the judgment, verse 34. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. That word torture, will come back to that at the very end. Now one of the reasons that the Lord, the master, the king, is so angry with the servant is not simply because he hadn't forgiven his fellow servant. I mean, that's bad enough, but that's really not the issue here. The issue is summed up in this phrase, just as I had on you. That's the issue. Just as I had forgiveness on you, just as I had shown grace on you, what makes the servant's unforgiveness and lack of grace so outrageous is that he had just been forgiven a debt so vast you can't even numerically state it. And now this is just a fraction of what he was owed. So this parable boils down to these three things. There's extravagant grace and forgiveness from the Lord. There is a shocking lack of grace and forgiveness by the forgiven servant. And then there's the Lord's response when we fail to show grace and forgiveness. And Jesus summarizes all of this in verse 35. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. And I don't think Jesus... Again, these are Jesus' words. He could be any more serious. I don't think he could be any more solemn than he is right here. That this is a big deal. This, again, is where the rubber meets the road. This is what separates the men from the boys. That our willingness to forgive or lack thereof will determine our relationship with God. Either we'll have a lifeline of grace flowing into our lives or we will cut it off. James 2.13, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, 
God will be merciful when he judges you. James is saying Jesus will treat us with a greater severity if we refuse to forgive others. And the implication is there's going to be a change of treatment. It's going to play out on a daily basis, but there are also eternal implications. Jesus says in Mark 11, 25, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Jesus is telling us God simply will not overlook unforgiveness in the life of a believer. If we refuse to forgive another, God has to discipline. God has to intervene. And a believer who deliberately refuses to forgive another for any reason will experience less and less of the everyday graces of God, the favor of God in their life than otherwise if that believer were to flow in grace and forgiveness to others. And what do those graces look like in our lives? I'm talking about times when things are really tight financially and a check somehow shows up in the mailbox. Your child is struggling in school and they come home and it's a miracle they got 100% on their math test. It's an April day in Wisconsin and it's actually above freezing even in the morning. It's a grace. God sends all those graces and blessings our way when we flow in grace and when we forgive others. And I believe Jesus is teaching us that when we limit grace and when we become unforgiving people, we will see those graces and blessings of God on an everyday basis begin to trickle down. Jesus says this in the later part of Luke 6, 37 and 38. He says, forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. If you measure out forgiveness with a bucket, then God comes back at you and he throws a bucket of forgiveness on you. If you measure out your forgiveness with a thimble, then God will bring out his thimble and pour that over your head. It's important that we understand we're not the hero of this story. We, we need to understand who's who, and every major character represents someone. And so talk back to me here. Who is the king in this story? God. Yes, always a safe answer in church. <laughs> Jesus, God. He's the one that has done the forgiving. Now, who is a servant who's been forgiven 10,000 talents? A smattering of hands, smattering. Yeah, that's all of us, raise your hand. We owed him a sin debt, a debt that cannot be paid. If he gave us all the time in the world, we couldn't have paid that debt. David says in Psalm 130, verse 3, he says, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? The answer, not you, not me, no one. But David goes on to say, but with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. That's grace. And that's beautiful. And you know what? God didn't just reduce our debt, although that would have been nice enough. God canceled it, just like the king did for the servant. He canceled the debt. He said, based on the blood of Jesus Christ, you don't owe me anything. The debt has been canceled. Psalm 103.12 says, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. So what did God do with your debt? God did with your debt the same thing the king did for the servant's debt. He forgave all the debt. 
So we as Christians, we play the role of the servant who's been forgiven the 10,000 talents. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ in that personal way, you have not asked him to remove the debt. He's willing and able to do that today. You can do that in just a moment. Lastly, who is the servant who owes a a hundred bucks? Look around. It's everyone else. It's all of us. Uh, It's your neighbors. It's your friends. It's your relatives, your co-workers, brother, sister, wife, husband. Everyone in this church is your fellow servant. And in comparison to what each of us have owed God, anything that you owe me, I owe you, is so tiny in comparison. The king asked his servant, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? That really is the heart of whether God's grace will flourish in your life or whether it shrivels up. Our obligation to forgive is not because we feel like it, because most of the time we won't feel like it. Our obligation to forgive is not simply based on that there is a command in scripture and that God expects it of us. No, it's much deeper than that. And frankly, it's far more personal than that. Our obligation to forgive is directly connected to the fact that God has forgiven us a far more. What made the king angry is not simply the refusal to forgive, but that he refused to forgive after he had been forgiven so much. Throughout the word of God, it always connects these two things, what God has done for us and then what we do for others. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Do you hear the connection? It's the same theme that Jesus talks about. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. It's all just repeating what Jesus says here in verse 33. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And so I want to say this as clearly as possible. A Christian, a follower of Christ, under any circumstance, never has the right to refuse anyone a forgiveness. You have no right to refuse forgiveness of anyone for anything at any time. When we have been forgiven such a crushing debt, so vast you can't even put a number on it, It really takes a special kind of person to get worked up over a hundred bucks. As a follower of Christ, forgiveness is not optional. It's mandatory. It's not occasional. It's an everyday practice. You know, people talk about, well, you can get bitter or you can get better. That's cliche. It's very true. Because any old person can get bitter. It takes someone great to forgive. Anyone can hate. It takes a great man, it takes a great woman to operate in grace. And we ought not limit grace. We need to forgive like God forgives. Fully, freely, totally. You may say, you know what, I'll forgive you, but this is the last time. Does God ever say that to you? I don't think so. Say, well, but you've hurt me really bad this time. But truth be told, I've hurt God. And God has never, when I have come to him for repentance, said, you know what? You have hurt me too bad to forgive you. You may say, you know what, I'm getting tired of forgiving you for the same thing over and over and over. Friend, doesn't God forgive you of the same thing over and over and over? He does. 
And God knows you, he created you, he knows how you flourish. And so he has given you this mandate of forgiveness, not to be a rock tied around your neck, but so that you could actually operate in grace. That you could have the favor of God flowing through your life. Nothing will poison a soul like unforgiveness. Nothing will destroy a person's spiritual life, cause it to shrivel up like a prune more than bitterness. And the person who really gets hurt is you. I want to end with this one last word, torture. Torture. Verse 34, in his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. God has allowed torture to be a symptom of unforgiveness. And if there's some level of torture in your life, there's a vein possibly of unforgiveness that's it's running just underneath the surface. It could just be resentment. You'd say, yeah, I've forgiven that person, but you know, something Christians say, this is funny, I love you, but I don't have to like you. You won't hear that at work tomorrow morning, <laughs> but at church you hear that. I love you, but I don't have to like you. It's resentment. And uh, we were at a pastor's conference this week and the speaker said this, I thought it was so good, that resentment is unforgiveness in your life collecting interest. And it's torture. Um, it could be, you know, you spend all your time talking about boundaries and yeah, we need to have wisdom in this. Um, but if we're talking more about boundaries than we are talking about forgiveness, there's things out of balance here. Sometimes there's torture that we invite into our lives. It could be anxiety. It could be the fact that our family, we can't ever just all be together. It could be you have some goals in your life and it just feels like you hit a brick wall every time. But there's just torture. And here's what I believe that God wants to do in this service. Today, the torture ends forever. The torture stops today because you are going to stand up and you're going to say, I'm done with the torture and I am forgiving completely. I'm canceling the debt. They owe me nothing. This is a settled matter. I believe if you do that, God's going to do something very memorable in your life today. You'll, you'll remember this is the day that the torture ended for you. So please join me in prayer. Jesus, we thank you, first of all, that you have forgiven us of a debt so great. It wasn't simply that we needed better terms or a longer time. There was no way that we could repay it. And in the greatest act of grace the world has ever known, Lord, you paid the debt. And so if you're here this morning and you've sensed like God has been tugging at your heart, you know that you've been far away from the Lord. Maybe you've never personally known the Lord. You've never uh, walked with the Lord. You've never given him your life. You've never asked him to wipe away the debt. He is willing to do that right now. And you can simply say, Jesus, I come to you. I come to you as a sinner. I come to you as a man or a woman that has racked up a, a tremendous debt. And I ask that you take the debt. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He wipes away that debt. And you can just, you can work that out with Jesus right now. You can tell him, Jesus, I give you my debt. I give you my sin. Forgive me, Jesus. And he's going to do that. But we also want to do business here with the believers. And there are believers that have walked in here today. And you would say, truth be told, I'm tortured. 
there is a heaviness in my spirit, there is an ongoing depression, there's anxiety, there are people that I avoid. They're taking up all this space in my head and my heart. There's torture where I feel like everything is uphill, like I'm not operating in the grace and favor of the Lord. And, and today is the day that that all can change as you release that person. I'm just gonna ask you, with every eye bowed and eyes closed, if that is you, would you just please stand where you're at? I'm gonna pray over you now. I believe the act of standing, God is gonna meet you in your stand. Give one more moment. Many are standing. And so, Jesus, right now, Lord, we release that person. We cancel out the debt. Maybe it was a business deal gone bad we were taken advantage of. Maybe it was a job that ended, a relationship that ended. Maybe it's just offhanded comments that have just, or sarcasm that has built up. Jesus, we release it all. We release the offense. And Jesus, I pray that for every brother and sister standing right now, Lord, that 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 faucet of grace would be a waterfall over their life, Lord, that your grace would renew them and strengthen them in their spirit. You restore the joy of their salvation. You give them peace of mind. You give them a perfect sleep tonight. And tomorrow, you let your grace is new each morning. Jesus, do something amazing, beautiful. The torture is done. That's gone. Thank you for doing that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.